Hello, I hope you're all well. In today's video, I'm going to talk about getting to know your gear and why that's more important than buying new stuff. In today's video, I'm going to talk about knowing your gear inside and out and how it's going to help you get better results. In this video, today I'm talking about my Nikon F5 and my Sony A7 Mark II, which I can't show you because I'm using it to film me. The reason why I'm talking about these two cameras in particular is because a couple of weeks ago I shot a wedding. I decided to use both cameras for the wedding because I wanted to shoot a bit of film and digital. Now it's not my first time shooting weddings and it's not my first time shooting weddings with both. But today I want to talk to you about how I went about it, what I used and what I think the takeaways are and what I can learn for shooting weddings going forward and hope ooh, any kind of events where I'm alternating and then pass on anything which hopefully you'll be able to pick up. So let's talk about arguably the less interesting camera first. That is the Sony a7 Mark II that I'm currently using to film myself. Um, I've had this camera for probably come up to about four years now, and I know it like the back of my hand. I can adapt to everything really quickly. I can change everything around super quick. I've been shooting it for years, and I absolutely love it. It is my workhorse of a camera. It is my professional camera that I use for things like this. Uh, I know what I can do with it, I know what I can't do with it, and to be honest there's not much it can't do. Uh, the only thing really is the autofocus isn't the best, it's it's more than good enough for day-to-day -day use and things like that, and I generally have no problems with it. Probably the only thing I wouldn't want to shoot with it is sports, especially for something running directly towards you, but otherwise it's an incredibly capable camera, and I think it kind of tends to get dismissed a lot of the time, especially when you look at the leaps and bounds Sony have made like the A9 and the A7 Mark III, but it is an incredibly capable camera. So that is the camera I use for most of my pro work, and certainly anything digital, it is all on the Sony A7 Mark II. For this wedding, I used two lenses. I used my 50mm f1.8 Sony lens, and I used the 35-135 to Nikon lens, which is currently filming me at the moment. Uh, that is an autofocus Nikon lens, but on the Sony, it is a manual focus lens, because uh, there is no motor in there to drive it. So the other camera I used on the day was my Nikon F5. Now, I haven't had this that long in the grand scheme of things. Where I've had the Sony for four years, I've had this for about four months. Now, this replaced my old camera, my Nikon F80, and from a function point of view, there's actually not too much difference between them, you know? They have the same metering modes. You know, the, the main thing is obviously the build on this, the vertical grip, the up to eight frames a second autofocus, and continuous shooting. That's basically it, you know. Um, the F80 is a fantastic all-around camera, uh, and if it didn't break, I'd still have it, and that's the only reason I've got this, because if you're gonna get a replacement, go hard or go home, in my opinion. So yeah, I shot the wedding, I used two film stocks on the wedding. I used Portra 400 and Portra 800. Uh, it was my first time shooting Portra 800, but, you know, Portra's Portra, or so I thought. Bruh. Anyway. Let me talk to you about the way I shoot these cameras, because they're two very different ways, unless it's zoomed photography, in which I shoot exactly the same regardless. But for day-to-day -day shooting, let me tell you how I shoot these cameras. So on the Sony, I shoot pretty much all manual all the time. I stick on manual, and I adjust everything myself, kind of as I go on the fly. Um, something like a wedding, I will set my ISO and forget it. So for this day, the ISO was on 800, I believe, the whole day. I think I might have bumped it a little bit in the on the inside portion, maybe the 1600. But uh, generally speaking, if I'm doing something like, say, an event or a gig or something like that, I would tend to set my ISO and forget it, basically. Uh, and then that just leaves me my aperture and shutter speed, which I will then control. Uh, I pretty much go off the image in the viewfinder. I do, you know, I do check the exposure reading every so often, but 99.99999% of the time, I just look at what the viewfinder is because, I've, like I said, I've been using this camera for four years. I used the A6000 for two years before it got stolen, and uh, so I know what looks good in that viewfinder. So for me, I can use it so easily, so intuitively, and I can just, bam, get know exactly what I want, and that plays a key factor into some of these images. I also tend to stick the Sony on spot metering most of the time, uh, mainly from mainly as a carryover from when I shot in zoos, just to kind of check. Uh, I would basically use it as a highlight weighted meter to get those really, really black shadows essentially. So I would pick the brightest part of the scene, meter for that, and then I would go from there. But again, a lot of things I do on there visually. Now, with the F5, what I tend to do is I shoot this very differently because I'm still learning it, is I tend to shoot this in aperture priority, 
Um, and the metering mode, it honestly depends on what I'm doing and what takes my fancy on the day. Uh, for the wedding, I shot it on centre-weighted metering. Now, the reason I shot centre-weighted metering is because my F301 is centre-weighted metered camera, and I've been using that a lot because that is as we talked about in previous videos, that is the camera that I take pretty much everywhere I go with me. It's the only camera I've got with a strap on it, and that is just because it lives in my bag, and then when I go out on my lunch break or I go whatever, I just sling it over my shoulder and I'm good to go. Uh, so that is my just chucking a bag camera. This is my, like, you know, weddings, events, that kind of stuff camera, because as we talked about previously, it's bloody heavy. So I've got a, I've got a lot of shots that I really love from the F301. That was part of my reason for picking centre-weighted metering on this. So with my book, Ferrimon 35mm, I shot everything with the matrix metering, and that was because I had <laughs> I bought the camera, um, it arrived, and the day it arrived, I went out, I bought batteries, and I shot the first two rolls of that book with the matrix metering, uh, where it was a brand new camera to me, although it was very similar to previous cameras I've owned, you know, I didn't want to cock anything up, essentially. So I let the camera do the work, and ultimately, that's what it's built for. You know, this, it's got all these tools in. It's not cheating to use matrix metering. It is there to be used. Um, now, I find whenever I do use matrix metering, um, I don't get as much contrast as I'd normally like because it's taking everything into consideration. You know, I'm more than happy to dump the shadows. I don't really care too much. Yes, they can get a bit muddy when you're going on film, and when you're going for digital and film, they're completely different kettles of fish when it comes to shadows. I have no problem dumping the shadows at all. Uh, I quite like a contrasty image. Uh, I find matrix metering, it gives me a very good overall image, but it doesn't necessarily give me what I'm after. So. For the day, I shot this on centre-weighted metering. Uh, it was an incredibly overcast day, and for outside, there was no issues whatsoever. It's when we got inside, and I'll explain to you why, and what I would do differently next time. So, one of the things I did do on the day was I just alternated between my A7 and my F5. So, I'd be taking shots, and then I'd go, right, camera on the floor, other camera, take a few shots. So, a lot of the shots I've got here, and I've tried, I've got nine shots in total, and I've tried to kind of match them as closely as I could, because a lot of them were literally taken and then switch camera taken again. So there's a lot of very similar shots there between the two cameras that I can use for comparison. Like I said, on the F5, I use Portra 400 and Portra 800. Let's talk about the first image. So this is pretty standard. This is the arrival of the bride and groom. The bride turned up in a Nissan GTR, and the groom turned up in a Ford Meteor. And this first image I've got, just them standing in front of the car, nothing too spectacular, pretty standard arrival shots. And this is kind of just a reference, and this can sh this is for me a reference of when I spoke about outside, it was very overcast, you know, the light was pretty neutral, no matter what really. So the differences between the film and digital, with the exception of the characteristics, not too bad at all, certainly from an exposure point of view or anything like that, absolutely fine. So you can see here, this is the digital one. Now let's go to the one on Portra 400. So this image here, also in front of the Ford Meteor, just a slightly different angle, but you can see, you know, overall from an exposure point of view, everything like that, they're both pretty similar. Again, it's just really the characteristics of the film that you can see the difference in. Obviously there's the film grain. I think I might have cropped it slightly as well, but not too much. Um, I think my film scans equate to about an 18 megapixel image as well. So you've got 18 and 24 megapixels there, just to give you some reference. So, you know, not night and day, and when you got them actually in the prints, they were very, very close. But uh, on a screen, obviously, you can see huge differences. So the next image I'm going to show, so these were after the ceremony. This was on the, uh, just a bench in the garden, and, you know, the standard family shots, and the bride's family, and the groom's family, you know, all of those shots. Again, nothing too spectacular, nothing creative, but the shots that you need to get as a wedding photographer. So this is the couple on the bench. Nice. Uh, let's go to the portrait version. This was Portra 800 by this point. And we can see again, a bit more grain because we're using Portra 800 rather than Portra 400, but overall very similar. Um, yeah, very similar. Again, the same overcast flat lighting. We only move to another shot, so this is after the ceremony and we've got the bride and groom in front of the car. Again, just nice couple posy shots. Digital, and then we've got film as well. Uh, this is a roll, we're back to Portra 400, and I developed this on a different day. Um, again, there's like an ever so slight green tint. Um, I found this particular roll ended up being really washed out from the skin tone, so I did have to really boost the saturation just to give it a bit more, you know, to make them not look like they died, uh, which is always ideal, especially on a day of, you know, like a wedding. You want your people to look alive. So now I'm going to move to the indoor shots, and this is where 
this isn't me saying the A7 is better than the F5. This was my cock up, and this is where my four years of using the A7 plus in combination with an electronic viewfinder really came ahead of the four months using the F5. So this is a shot of them in the ceremony. So you can see that she is incredibly heavy backlit. There's a huge window, there's a lamp behind her. She's obviously wearing a white dress. This all adds to a lot of brightness in the scene. I metered this with my eye. I just looked through the viewfinder, went bam, there we go. Nice and easy, lovely exposure. Now this is one of the better shots. Uh, the reason being, and I can tell you straight away why, so it's better exposed, and that is because of the groom's jacket. The groom's jacket, you can see there, is still really dark, but that overall would have caused the camera to say, ah, I need this scene to be brighter, or it's smack bang in the middle of the image. So in this image, you've got the jacket, you've got the back of his head, which again, it's about, probably about middle grey. Um, you've got the lamps in the middle, you've got the backlit windows. So uh, quite a few of these images from here, the camera, correctly so, thought, ah, this is really bright, I'm going to tone it down a bit. Now, when I was inside, what I should have done was just set to spot metering, set it to manual, and gone, right, let's pick any member of the family, let's point it at their face so I can get a reading for their skin. And then I should have just set it and left it. Until I started shooting film, and I only occasionally shoot my wife's DSLR, I pretty much exclusively shot electronic viewfinders. Obviously, with an electronic viewfinder, what you see is what you get. And if you're used to that, it's so easy to see a real viewfinder and think that that's what's happening, when that's not at all the case. What I should have done, like I said, was set a spot, metered for someone's face. It didn't really matter who. Everyone had very similar skin tones. The room, yes, there was backlighting, but overall, when you're in the middle of the room, the room was very consistent. It was obviously much darker than outside, but I should have metered for their face, sent to manual, and gone, right, that's it. Those are the settings while I'm inside. That's what I should have done, but that's not what I did. I left it on aperture priority, I had it on center-weighted metering, and then as a result, it was taking things like the window behind her into account, the wedding dress would have been taken into account. So all of these things would have made the overall image darker, and that's exactly what happened. This is the brightest of those images. The rest of them are a bit darker. Like I said, this isn't the camera's fault, this is entirely my fault, and this comes down to actually me not being as experienced in the gear as I would have liked. Now, there's potentially the argument that me switching between two different cameras, one using an EVF, one using an OVF, would have been a factor, and I I would say that's incredibly valid. If I was using, say, a D3 and an F5, I probably wouldn't have had as much of an issue because I probably would have set them up exactly the same. Um, but for me, that really highlights the importance of actually, you need to know what your camera can and can't do. Knowing what it can't do is just as important as knowing what it can do. And if you know that you're, you know, if you know that you've only got manual focus lenses and you're shooting sports, you need to be pre-focusing to an area where someone is going to run through that and then wait for that shot. And it's important to know what your camera is capable of. Not just that, but actually how your camera is set up. Matrix metering probably would have saved my bottom on the inside of that room, whereas spot metering, you know, because of the backlighting and everything like that threw the image out, at the same time I could have shot manually, but because I was shooting so quickly and I'm not as used to an OVF as I am an EVF, I wasn't going to be as quick and I was scared about missing shots. Anyone who knows me knows that I started off doing zoo photography. So, you know, long lenses, especially really dramatic light images. Like I said, when I'm shooting the sunny, I pretty much, you know, if I'm in a zoo, I shoot for the highlights and then I will expose for that and let everything fall into blackness. Now, I've done that with this camera. We went to Edinburgh Zoo and I've shot zoo photography here and I set it up the exact same way as I do with my Sony. I set it to spot metering, I would then take metering readings of the highlights and then I would just accordingly knowing how that image was going to come out. And those images, which I can, I'll have to load into here, pretty much came out exactly how I expected. So I know I'm capable of doing that and it's just a case of actually remembering what I'm using. It's not a drawback, it's just knowing that using a different bit of equipment and there's not to say that this is right and that is wrong or vice versa, but it's saying actually knowing the limitations or understanding what your gear is capable of is more important. I hope this has been of help to you and I hope you have a lovely day.